American Roots music is the blending of Eurocentric instruments and music influenced by the African American experience of the Deep South. Folk, blues, jazz, and spirituals, just to name a few. We'll talk about American Roots music, its history, and impact on a nation's culture on Newsmakers. The popular music that you hear today is the melding of spiritual, blues, jazz, gospel, country and western, bluegrass, old-time folk, swing, rhythm and blues, rock and rap. Reverend Robert Jones Sr. is a singer, storyteller, and self-taught multi-instrumentalist and a preacher. If you want to understand American Roots music, this is the man you turn to. <laughs> How are you, sir? Fine, how are you, sir? I'm great, you made the drive over from Detroit? I did, it was very uneventful, which is not <laughs> always a given in, you know, in this lovely winter time that we have in the state of Michigan, but yeah, it was pretty good. You're here safely and uh, you're here to tell a story, the story of American Roots music. I, I think if you've ever had the opportunity to walk through the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you mm -hmm. get a taste of it mm -hmm. when you first walk in. But I think a lot of people just scoot on by. Right. They want to see the glitz and the showmen of today and, and right. really of our generation. But there is a deep and beautiful history of American music. That's true, Patrick. It, the thing is that uh, I think it was a great music writer named Albert Murray who talks about music, American music, in three contexts. He talks about folk music or roots music. Uh, popular music and then classical music and the music is always moving it's pretty fluid it moves between those three that you could take a popular tune and it may become classical um, let's say the jazz of Duke Ellington for example but at the same time you have a lot of folk music that um, informs popular music so you've constantly got that flow and most people are familiar with classical music and more people are familiar with, with uh, popular music. But the idea of folk music um, is something that we are familiar with, but we just take it for granted. When you go back in time, when you, when you look at the birth of this nation and kind of this 18th century, 19th century, again, it's that, that influence of, of Europe, but then of African Americans in the Deep South. Right and the transition of melodies and everything else that takes place. You're the historian here. What, what happened not so long ago? Well, it's a pretty complex story, but in a nutshell, what happens is that in the North, um, in the 18th, 19th century, people are often interested in European music because that's what's good. And so in the North, in Boston, New York, probably in Detroit, you'd have these places built to listen to primarily European music. But in the South, you had European music right next to African music with the influence of Native American music with folks like the Acadians coming down from Canada. That's French music. And all of this music sort of comes together in this great melting pot in the South. Um, sort of we use as, a, as a, an example a song like Amazing Grace, which in a white church in the 1800s may have been sung without very much vibrato, pretty much on the beat, you know, even maybe out of a hymnal. So you'd have like, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But in a black church, maybe in one of those invisible churches that Frederick Douglass talks about, that song might take a different journey. It might be, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Take that same idea, move it up to Kentucky, where you have modal singing, where they eliminate the third from the song, from the, from the scale, and you might have something like, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And so all of those different versions of Amazing Grace come from that idea of a European melody called New Britain with words written by, you know, a, a slaving captain. But all of those things constantly change depending on where they're learned and how they're taught. And then you have all these genres that, that come from the spring of the South. I mean, I rattled them all off in the show open. There Absolutely. So many. Absolutely. And it's all kind of different 
takes or gradations on the same music because people are constantly listening to each other and modifying what they hear according to, you know, to, to their taste or to their needs. And I think that's another thing that people don't necessarily understand, that a song may take on an entirely different form depending on what it's used for. If it's used in, uh, in, in a black church, if it's used for a baptism, that song may be kind of long and repetitive with breaks as people go into the water. But if it's a praise song, it's going to be lively and with hand claps. If it's a funeral, the same song might be slowed down and, and almost turned into a moan or a dirge. But all of that stuff happened organically. You've got these folks in every community who are the singers, who are the keepers of the tradition, and they know how to manipulate these songs. And, and this is a heritage that we still benefit from. And part of that heritage, and you are a storyteller, you're saying much of this is story living. I mean, there's a story that's being told here. Absolutely. In fact, I used to work with the Detroit Historical Museum, and we had a program called Story Living, which allowed uh, students, primarily children, but sometimes for seniors, to jump into a story and to sort of act it out. And, and sometimes that's fun because one of the things that our gadgets, our iPads and, and iPhones and all those other i things allow us to do is to sort of remove ourselves from the reality of the world that our parents lived in and our grandparents experienced. And it's really great because music, work, uh, role play sort of allows us to go back and imagine some of those things that, that they were really dealing with. Um, one of the things you find now in popular music is basically songs are about falling in love and falling out of love and being mad at the person you fell in love with and all that kind of stuff. But then when you start to listen to folk music, folk music is often about survival and, you know, where will I find my next meal and where will I find work and, and what are the frustrations that come with living? Once, that I, once I found my love, you know, how do I keep my love alive? Literally, how do I feed my love? How do I feed my children? You know, what are the hopes and dreams and aspirations that we have as a society? Those things are in that kind of mature folk music. It's, it sounds like the essence of country, western, and blues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I sometimes jokingly demonstrate that uh, if a song was sung by Muddy Waters, it might sound one way, but if the same song was sung by, by Johnny Cash, it would take on a whole different identity, but it would be the same song. And I know that you actually play and, and you can present us with that. Yeah, that, I mean, that you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of... It's fun to do this. It's fun to do this, right. It's like, you know, I'm the, I'm the guy who shows up in your, in your school and you kind of go, oh, what's he doing with the guitar? And at the end, you, you sneak over and, and tell me that you actually maybe learned a couple things. But yeah, I was, I was like making that uh, illusion. If Muddy Waters did a song like Catfish, it might. Well, I wish I was a catfish Swimming in a hole, deep blue sea I'd have all you good-looking women Fishing out of me Out of me but if Johnny Cash did it, it would be. I wish I was a catfish Swimming in a deep blue sea Well, I wish I was a catfish Swimming in a deep blue sea I'd have all you good-looking women Trying to set a hook for me So, you know, it's basically the same song. But obviously when we hear certain things, certain clues. Uh, in American music, we hear this. We call the turnaround in blues. But Jimmy Rogers turned that turnaround into a yodel. But it's the same music, you know, same structure, and often carries the same message. Interesting, you mentioned yodel. I'm, I'm having this front row experience 
And the last time I had a front row experience was with my Uncle Look in Germany, and he was <laughs> yodeling to me back in the 1990s. Oh, my so, goodness. Uh, there's a deep appreciation for music here and culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just crossed the Atlantic for a minute there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, who knows where that, where Jimmy Rogers got that yodel. It, there may, your uncle could have been passing through town or whatever. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things where people heard this music and heard elements that they decided to put together in new and interesting ways. It could have, Jimmy Rogers very possibly may have heard a German guy yodeling, or he may have heard um, a musician like Tommy Johnson who used to not yodel, but used to have this kind of like, if I never see your face again. <laughs> kind of a falsetto thing. So, I mean, who knows what, what those elements were that helped to form country music with uh, someone like Jimmy Rogers and, and somebody like the Carter family, M Mother Maybell, A.P. Carter, and Sarah Carter. We consider them to be the first family of country music, but they were constantly uh, being exposed to, listening to, uh, bringing out old blues tunes that they had heard, um, especially Maybell Carter, was a great blues woman. Um, and she would uh, hang out with a guy by the name of Leslie Riddle, who taught, went, you know, went along in the black community and sort of helped her find songs. So it's, it's amazing that if you use the metaphor of this tree and, and the idea of these roots, the thing that's great about roots is they don't grow straight. They're all tangled up. How do you pull those roots apart? Well, sometimes you, you, you pull them apart and sometimes you just leave them be. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, what you do is I think you find the things that are common to our music. Um, you know, one of the things you do in a classroom is you'll talk about the five notes of the pentatonic scale that, and the three chords. How many songs are built on those? That, that idea in, in 1920s, it may have been uh, Boogie Woogie Blues. Well, help me down my jumper, won't shine my old cross. Won't you help me down my jumper, baby, won't shine my old cross. Well, I'm about to catch a train, yeah. What they call a cannonball? Right. Same five notes in the 1930s becomes the basis of gospel. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burden down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burden down. Same five notes in the same three chords. In 1935 becomes the basis of bluegrass, where you have Lester Flatt instead of playing this, he plays it. Well, I'm going down the road feeling bad. Well, I'm going down the road feeling bad. Well, I'm going down the road feeling bad. But Lord, and I ain't going to be treated as Same five notes. 1940s, it becomes the basis of Ray Charles doing a Tell me what I say, tell me what I say, we'll say, hey, hey, oh, oh, hey, oh, 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 hey, hey, oh, tell me what I say, tell me what I say, tell me what I say, tell me what I say. Of course, you know, 1950s. It becomes the basis of everything from, you know, uh, Chuck Berry to, well, run for the money, for the show, you to run and I go, cat go, but don't you, that's my blue suede shoe. Well, you've been doing the song, stay off my blue suede shoe. Right, same five notes in the 1960s, take them, slow it down, play with the rhythm. So you see, I mean, it's like it doesn't 
take long to see that this stuff is so connected because these musicians are constantly listening to each other, borrowing the elements they need, speeding it up, slowing it down, adding strings or deleting, you know, electrifying the music or whatever, but it's the same music. You know. the, the bigger picture, and we've just, we just went through decade after decade after decade, mm -hmm. how, how does all of this music, American Roots music, how does it create this identity of our country or how we're perceived around the world? Well, one of the things is I think that when you, you really look at American music, when, when, when we were just emulating or listening to appreciating European music in the North in the, in the 18th and 19th century, that was great. American music was kind of like the poor stepchild of European music. But when you think about American music getting its identity, then it goes all over the world. I mean, kids in Japan know Elvis, and kids in Europe were listening to Muddy Waters, and, and, and a lot of times world um, people in the, in the, in the, in the uh, broader sense of the world appreciate American music more than Americans do. So you've got that uh, as being one of those great uh, forms of, um, I guess, ambassadorship. As, as the American artists tour, they take that music with them and, and everybody around the world falls in love with it. But in America, it also sort of helped to break down a lot of racial barriers and social prejudices. Imagine in between, say, 1956 and 59, or 54 and 57, you had young kids who were listening to Chuck Berry, and Little Richard, and Elvis Presley, and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. And some of those black kids wanted to be Elvis, and some of those white kids wanted to be Chuck Berry. And so, in spite of what their parents told them about this kind of music and the people who make it, they were listening to it. And it was changing hearts and minds even before Dr. King and, and another form of this music was able to bring about, help to bring about changes of laws. This music was already working on our minds and the American identity of who we are as Americans. Because there was kind of this segregation of music at one point okay. where you had the white artists who were essentially stealing the spotlight away from the original artists who were behind the music. Absolutely. I mean, in Sometimes that was a commercial decision. Um, you have somebody like uh, Pat Boone who takes Little Richard's song uh, and, and just like, first of all, he sort of cleaned it up <laughs> and made it, you know, safe to listen to. And even in the wake of that, of that explosion of music that we're talking about in the mid-50s, after that music, they tried to put the the genie back in the bottle and artists like Neil Sadaka and the music became really kind of vanilla and, and, and safe. But guess what? It broke out again in, in the 60s and in the 70s. So you, you had folks who feared the mixing of the races. They feared miscegenation. Uh, they were concerned that white kids were listening to black music and and I'm sure that there were folks in the black community who feared that black kids were listening to too much white music. But those kids didn't care. They just, <laughs> they just listened and enjoyed and, again, started to break down a lot of those barriers. But with that suppression at that time, did it also kind of push out artists to, to go to Europe, to go to places like Paris and other of the European center cities, and that really helped to... I'm sure, the growth. I'm sure it did. You know, I mean, a lot of artists, especially jazz artists, especially the more innovative and, and creative and controversial artists, found a welcome home in Europe, whereas they were just running into opposition in the United States. And, and in reverse, you had artists like the Rolling Stones when they first came to the United States, having listened to all of this great blues. You know, the reporters met them and said, uh, so, what would you like to see when you're, now that you're in America? And they said things like, oh, we would like to see Muddy Waters and, and Alan Wolf. And, and they would go, Muddy Waters, 
where is that? And is it, is it in California? And, and, and the, they were stunned. They were like, don't you know who your famous people are? <laughs> you know, because they had been exposed to black music, whereas in America, that black music had been partitioned and, and basically kept under the rug, or people heard imitations of that music. You know, and, 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 and really you think about it, even something as strange as minstrelsy in the 1800s was people listening to authentic black music and then parroting what they heard. So most folks thought that when they heard Stephen Foster, they were hearing black music. Stephen Foster was creating it in New York and doing all those great songs like uh, Down on the Swanee. Whereas, you know, at the same time, you know, um, enslaved folks were singing some of the most beautiful spirituals you could imagine. But until Fisk University singers began to tour, taking it to Europe, nobody had any idea what authentic black music was. What did, when, you, when you travel to elementary schools, and I had, a, I had an opportunity to watch a YouTube video of you with some, it was, it was fantastic. They were all engaged. Thank you. What is your, what is your message? How do, you, how do you get kids to get immersed in this and to explore music and in particular American music? Well, I think about one of the things that when I was a kid, I was maybe 10 or 11 years old when my grandmother brought home this record by Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. And it was so different from any of the popular music that I heard that it caught my ear. And that's why probably to this day, if without that record, my whole life changes. Uh, I started playing harmonica and going to a pawn shop and getting a guitar and that kind of thing. So part of the message is to let kids know that this music is important and that it has a message. Part of it is the idea of learning to respect, if you will, grandpa and grandma's music you know, instead of running from it as being something strange and weird, to say, oh, this is cool. But a part of it, too, is the immediacy of it. The fact is you don't need to have dancers on the stage with you. You don't need to have laser lights or pyrotechnics or wardrobe malfunctions in order to do this kind of music. And they've been doing it all the time. They just don't realize it. You know, when my, when my kid... My son, who is now 24, when he heard me doing um, This old man, he played one, he played knick-knack on my thumb. He's going, Dad, 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 you're playing it wrong. I said, what are you talking about? I mean, you're playing it right, but you're singing it wrong. <laughs> what are you talking about? That song is, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. Kids are exposed to this stuff through public television, through cartoons, through movies, anyway, but they just don't know that, they're, that they know folk music. So when they hear it coming from an adult and in a different context, they tend to respond to it pretty easily and pretty naturally. ABC's Twinkle Twinkle, they're, twinkle, all, twinkle. they're <laughs> all the same song, they're, absolutely. They're all the same thing. Because early on, folk singers knew that if you took a familiar melody um, and attach new words to it, it would be easier to learn and easier to, to remember. It, it seems there's a maturing, though, as you and I mature. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, no, where when you're younger, you're engaged in the popular music. Mm -hmm. As you get older, your tastes change. I mean, I am fully immersed in jazz right. and blues, and I love listening to Gershwin. I mean, you're, it seems like your taste just you want so much more than just the pop stuff, which I still right. listen to. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and that's a, a beautiful thing that we need to understand. Even I think record companies don't appreciate how your changing taste begins to need something a little deeper. Uh, your, your maturation tends to move you toward certain things uh, that are a little deeper. Um, and the tendency is to try to go after that young market, go after that youth market with, by any means necessary and to constantly recycle these artists who last about six months. But, you know, I've learned a lot by guys like you, from guys like Utah Phillips and um, Mike Seeger and Pete Seeger and 
Brownie McGee, Sonny Terry, Sun House, Muddy Waters, um, not to mention, as you were talking about, Duke Ellington, Cal Basie, uh, Nina Simone, every kid, every, every young lady who's ever aspired to sing should know about Nina Simone, you know. And, and unfortunately, we generally don't present that to young audiences. If you're listening to us, I would rather, you know, and I have nothing against Beyonce. I think she's a wonderful young lady. But why can't I, instead of hearing Beyonce 20 times, why can't I hear Beyonce 15 times, but then hear Mahalia Jackson, Nina Simone, Leontine Price, uh, <laughs> you know, yep. uh, you, Ella you, Fitzgerald. You know what? We might have to pick up the phone and call Beyonce. She, need, she needs to talk with you. Reverend yeah, she's she's great, she's great, great young lady. I'm sure. Reverend Robert Jones Sr. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. I enjoyed it very much. And thank you for joining us this week on Newsmakers. Mm -hmm.